Anybody glad to be in God's house this morning? Good to sense again his presence. Good to have you here this morning. God bless you for your faithfulness. And let's just believe again as God has already met with us in our praise and worship this morning. He's fulfilled his promise of showing up whenever his people get together and praise and worship him. And I know again he'll speak to us through his word this morning. Um, God bless you. Looking forward again to Tuesday evening. Be here in your place a time of praise, worship, and adoration, and of course prayer as we come before our Lord and seek his face and his will, his purpose, and his interaction with our lives. And let's show up on Tuesday night expecting great things as well. Amen. Everybody enjoy your Easter week off. Great. I did, certainly did. A few days rest and relaxation. And uh, but good to be back in business again for God. Let's read the scriptures. Thank you, Stephen. Let's read from Joshua chapter 10. When they had brought these things, these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. What a brilliant line. <laughs> so they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you're going to fight. Then Joshua put the kings to death and exposed their bodies on five poles and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. Five kings, just keep playing with me, Jen, just stay there. Five kings were keeping Joshua's people from the promised land and Joshua and his army had chased them, but they hid in a cave. So we read the story of how once they were trapped, Joshua told the soldiers guarding the entrance to bring the five kings to him and the scriptures unfold their downfall as Joshua put them to death. We'll come back to Joshua shortly, but let's jump to 2 Timothy and read a couple of verses there. Thanks, Stephen. And that is why the writer says, I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So we know God will bless the reading of his word. Thanks, Jen. I know him whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him until that day. I want to share this morning for a while on sensitizing your senses sensitizing your senses and just stay with me until we get to the main point of our study this morning in these verses the apostle who's writing uses a very special greek word there in, in timothy and it's parathek and the word parathek means a treasure or deposit left with someone you trust completely a deposit left with someone you trust completely remember there were no banks like we have uh, today in paul's day so what could you do to make sure your money was safe? Where could you deposit it? How could you keep it safe? What would you do with your wealth if you went on a long journey, as many did in those days? And if you were to die, who would you trust to be the executor of your estate and make sure your family would get everything they were entitled to? The person you asked to take care of your wealth, your possessions, had to be someone you knew very well someone you trusted completely and that's the essence of the word that the writer the apostle is using here paul is saying about jesus in this verse not that he knows him as a historic figure or knew him as a friend or just knew him as a name who appears in books no paul is saying here i know the lord jesus christ i know the savior not only as my friend but i know him as the one who i can trust completely and every deposit that i have given into him I know that he will keep it safe for eternity. I can trust him completely with everything in my life that I have dedicated or deposited in him. He is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him. Uh, the writer says, I just trust him so much I'll give him everything, knowing that he will keep it safe. You see, sitting there in that prison cell, Paul had become sensitized, not by the horrible things all around him, or the situation or circumstances of life, or the beatings he took, or the shipwrecks, or all the stuff he had to endure. No, he had become sensitized to the workings of God in his life. Sensitized to God in his life. 
His troubles when compared to the joy that was his because of his friendship and lordship that he had and his savior with Christ looking after everything he had, he said, it's worth it all, everything I've had to endure because I can trust Christ with everything. You see, Paul understood that the same God who created the universe that surrounded him and maintained it from the day it was created, the same God, if Paul trusted him with everything he had, God could maintain that too. I have students felt the mist of Niagara Falls in my face, and it's awesome, it's incredible. If you haven't been there, go, just go. Just tell a bank manager, give you a loan and go. <laughs> Felt the mist of Niagara Falls in my face. I've wondered at the magnificence of our own wonderful Giant's Causeway. I've stood in the giant redwood forest of California and stood and looked at those awesome trees, some of them so big you can drive a car through the trunk of them. Stood on the beach in Santa Monica and watched the restless waves. What a sight, awesome. Gone to the depths of marble arch caves right here in Northern Ireland and I've looked into the starry skies of Queensland, Queensland and Australia and saw galaxies like I've never seen them exposed to my eyes before. And I can look at all those things and look at the miraculous work of God, but like Paul, more to the point, I can look at all that and say, if God can create and maintain that, then he can do everything for me if I'm willing to trust him with it. If he can keep the galaxies and the stars in place and the beauty of nature going day by day, day by day, day by day for thousands of years, then I can trust God with everything completely. He made me, he created me, he knows me better than I know myself. And if I'm willing to trust him and be sensitive to him, then God can keep me and sustain me in every circumstance of life. Let's jump back to Joshua in light of what we've just said. The King James Version of the scriptures that we read this morning use a word that we don't use very much in life today. The word is dismayed. And its most literal translation from the original text is to be made unable. Did you catch that? To be made unable. So Joshua was saying to his men here, when he said, don't be dismayed, don't worry, don't fret, be courageous, he was saying, don't be made unable. Don't fall apart, don't freak out, you're going through a great difficult situation, but don't be made unable by the circumstances that surround you. God is able. God is able, come on, somebody say amen, God is able. But something else was contained in the message and in the story of Joshua and his men. He said, yes, don't be made unable because God is able, but first of all, you have to take victory over the five kings that stand against you. Yes, God is able, but like Joshua, we still have to kill five kings that I'm going to share with you in our lives if we really want to serve God as we should and he wants us to. If you're going to win the battle of faith, if you want to see your family blessed, if you want to see your job blessed, your home blessed, your church blessed, if you want to see your own personal life grow in God, I'm going to share with you this morning five kings that we need to overcome in our life. By sensitizing ourselves, not to the circumstances that surround us or those who would oppose us, but by sensitizing our senses to the work of God in our lives. You with me so far? What are these five kings that we're going to look at this morning? Well, I hope you've guessed them already. There are senses. The sense of smell, what you can feel, what you can see, what you can hear, what you can taste. Because if these aren't sensitized properly, they become powerful evangelists of doubt and unbelief in our lives. And if we allow them to, these five kings or five senses can talk us or put us out of what God has already promised he wants to give to us and work in our lives. So let's ask a few questions this morning as we sensitize our senses. Everybody happy? Right, here's the first one. How do you smell this morning? Hmm? How do you smell this morning? Now I'm not talking about the aftershave or the deodorant that you put on before you come out to church, which I hope you did. <laughs> Praise God. No, I'm talking about can you smell the scent of God's presence? in your life? Can you smell and can others smell the scent of God's presence in your life? 
Remember in Daniel chapter 3, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were thrown into that fiery furnace. Miraculous, wonderful what God did, and God did deliver them, brought them out with not a hair on their heads burned. But then the scripture makes an interesting distinction, which I think is marvelous. It says there was no smell of fire on them. Ha, ha, come on. God's in the detail, isn't he? Fantastic. There was no smell of fire. They went through a furnace. They went through a huge fire that would have consumed them right to their very bones. But when they come out, not only were they delivered and safe and sound, you couldn't even smell the stench of the smoke on them. You know what it's like. Stand beside your barbecue the next time you're doing one. And by the time you're finished and you smell your sweater or your T-shirt, whatever it is, you stink. Nobody can, you can't prove to anybody you weren't working at that barbecue because you smell like it. These guys went through the fiery trial and come out smelling better than it actually went in because they carried the scent of God's presence on them. God doesn't want us to go through the trials, tribulations, and things of life and smell like them for the rest of our lives. Hmm? I'll say that again. He doesn't want us to go through those things and smell like them for the rest of our lives. God is able to bring us through them and he wants us to come out still smelling good. Sometimes I meet people and they've been through a lot, fiery trials, tribulations, the circumstances of life, and all you can do is smell what they've come through because all they want to do is talk about them and live there and stay there. They continue to carry the smell of their past situations, trials, tribulations, failures, be what it may. Maybe you were burned in a relationship on that side. Maybe you were burned in a business deal. Maybe you were burned at church where somebody unwittingly or even purposely hurt you. Perhaps now because of it, you carry the stench and the smell of all those things and you begin to judge everybody and live life in the smell of those things. I'm telling you today, God wants us to smell different. He wants us to carry the scent of his anointing, his presence, his work, his capability, his ability in our lives. If we're going to win the fight of faith, first we'll have to gain the victory over what we smell like. What we smell like. I don't want to smell like everything I've been through. Because if it did, it would stink. It wouldn't be very pleasant. Ministry has taken me through a lot of stuff a lot of stuff that was wonderful, but a lot of stuff that I didn't like. And people in ministry especially can take home the smell of their work, dealing with problems and messy situations and issues. But I don't want to take that smell around in my life. Just imagine, for example, how those Old Testament priests must have smelt in the sacrificial element that they worked in, the blood, the gore, the burning of sacrifices. That's why the priests were instructed above Many other reasons to burn incense. God said to kill the smell of the ministry. So when you left and went home, you still smelled good. You didn't take the smell of the burning and the sacrifice. You took home the sense that you'd been in the presence of God in his temple worshiping him. And likewise, the burning of our incense is what he did this morning when we praised and worshiped him and God's presence enveloped this place and he started to make us smell good from the stink of the world that we just left. Worship is our type of burning incense. Worshiping God helps grant us victory over the negatives of life. Worship puts us in that situation where we lose the smell of the situations, the circumstances, the trials, the problems, the things that the world would throw at us, and we leave this place on a Sunday morning, well, I hope we do anyway, smelling with the presence and scent of the anointing of the Spirit of God. Remember when... Um, <laughs> Lazarus had been dead for four days. Jesus told him to take the stone away from the front of his grave. And Martha says, Lord, don't be doing that. He stinks. He'll absolutely stink. What a statement of unbelief. Jesus had already told them they were going to see God's glory. Jesus didn't care what condition Lazarus was in. Jesus was saying to the man, even if it stinks, I can still change it. I can still bring it back with the scent and the smell of the anointing and the glory of God to magnify my name. Still believing, oh, come on, you're catching this this morning. Even if life stinks for you, still believe God can still make you smell good. You can still be sensitized to the presence of a living God rather than carry the burden of the smell of the issues of life around with you. 
Maybe there's a smell that hangs over your relationship, a smell that hangs over your finances, a smell that hangs over your job, your home, your family. Maybe your kids are driving you nuts because they can't seem to get your act together and it doesn't smell too good. Maybe you're suffocating from the smell of a world that's coming to you with doubts and fears and all sorts of issues and problems. In spite of what you smell, sensitize yourself to the presence of a living God and change how you walk out of these doors this morning with the scent of his presence and his anointing. If we're going to conquer, if we're going to live the way Jesus wants us to live, we've got to get our foot on our sense of smell because if we're not careful, you'll be burned by enough people, hurt by enough situations that you'll end up with an old stinky attitude and nobody will want to know you. Here's the message. Even though we've all been through the fire in some situation or circumstance, you don't have to smell like it. You can carry the sense and the presence of his anointing through every situation and circumstance of life because our God is able. And if we're willing to kill that sense of smell and sensitize it to the things of God, watch what God will do in our lives as he manifests himself with his presence upon us. Here's the second sense that we have to deal with. Here's the next question. Do you let your feelings hold you captive? Hmm? You see, the second sense we have to get our foot on is the sense of what we feel and how we react to those things. Because if we don't master our feelings, we'll start to trust them more than we trust our faith in God. Listen to Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Sometimes it's our feelings are the greatest enemy we have to faith and the greatest hurdle we have to letting God do what he needs to do in our lives. Do you remember Isaac? Isaac had gone blind in his old age and he was on his deathbed, as you know the story, when his son Jacob came to him covered with goat hair and intended to deceive him. Jacob's brother Esau was a hurry man and Jacob had come to steal the birthright. The blind father said, who is it? And Jacob said, it's me, Dad, it's your oldest son, Esau, I've come for my blessing. Scripture tells us that the old man reached up and started to feel his arm, trying to determine whether it was his oldest hurry boy or not. And Isaac said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. And Isaac decided to go with his feelings rather than what he was hearing. And as a consequence, you know the outcome of that story and that blessing. If we're going so often by what we feel instead of what we hear from God's word, watch this place, we're going to end up in trouble. Because we'll miss the truth of the essence of what God wants to speak into our lives. We have to get past simply living by our feelings. Mm. Now, come on, let's get real about it, church. Sometimes even in church you get your feelings hurt. Well, don't you? Well, at least three of us are honest enough to say yes. <laughs> of course you do. We're human beings, and you put more than three human beings in a one place for any more than about 10 minutes, and there's going to be an issue somewhere down the line. Sometimes you get your feelings hurt even in church. Sometimes in relationships, you're going to get your feelings hurt. Sometimes in your home and family, you're going to get your feelings hurt. In life, you're going to get your feelings hurt. But we have to put our foot in the neck of our feelings just like Joshua did with those kings and say, I'm not going to let my feelings rule what God wants to do in my life. Ah, I ain't giving up. Do you know, they gave an L a solo in, in the praise team and it didn't give me one. Ah, that's me done, I'm away. What an idiot. Do you know, Marty, did you know what he said about me? Ah. Uh, yeah, but just don't fall out with them, we'll fall out with God. Oh, come on, be honest with yourself this morning. Ah, uh, they overlooked me in that job and work, and I, that's the last time I'll be doing anything for, for, for that manager. I, I, I'll never be helping him out again. That's a wonderful Christian attitude. Come on, you know where I'm coming from, don't you? If we went purely by our feelings, half of us mightn't even show up in church this morning. We'd rather lie in bed. If Jesus had gone by his feeling, there wouldn't have been a Calvary and there wouldn't have been a resurrection. 
It's not about feeling free. It's knowing you're free because you've got freedom and liberty in what God is doing in our lives. The world still wants to captivate us by all the stuff that it pours upon us. And it can capture you in that sense. But here's the bottom line. Jesus says, I've come to give you life, life more abundant, and give you liberty and set you free to put my yoke upon you. And it might sometimes be heavy to carry and you might have to sacrifice, but there's freedom and liberty in it but we've got to overcome and sensitize our feelings, not to the circumstances around us, not by what other people try to do to us, by what the work of God that he's already doing in our lives and continues to do until he returns again. It's not about just feeling free. It's knowing that God has set you free. And even when you feel held captive by life and its circumstances, understand this, I'm free free from sin, free from condemnation, because God inhabits my life. Let's sensitize how we feel to the things that God has done for us and not what the world would try and put upon us. Come on, isn't this good stuff this morning? Here's number three. King or sense number three. What do you see? Are you looking for the bigger picture? Well, are you? Are you looking for the bigger picture? The Old Testament tells us in Kings a a really interesting story about Elisha the prophet and his servant. And I'm sure you know this story well. The king of Aram was at war with Israel and he had it in for Elisha because God kept telling Elisha the king's plans in advance. (laughs) I love the way God does that stuff. So at one point, Elisha and his servant were in a city surrounded by enemy soldiers. And Elisha sent his servant out to assess the situation. When he realized they were surrounded, Elisha's servant returned in a panic. He said, oh Lord, what are we going to do? Elisha calmly told him, don't be afraid and pray over him. Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And so when his servant went back out after being prayed that he might see properly, he just didn't see ground level anymore. He could see the hordes and the armies of God, the hills, it says, full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. He got his eyes open because he was looking at the bigger picture. Our problem is often the same as Elisha's servant. We get into the battles of life, the trials of life, the circumstances of life, and all we see is everything at ground level. Our level, our human ability, our human weakness, our human thinking patterns, our human inclination. But as believers, we're supposed to lift our eyes up higher than that. As Psalm 121 says, to lift our eyes to the hills from whence comes our help. What are you looking at today? The circumstances that are crawling like a snake on the ground, or are you looking at the heavenly hosts that the psalmist says are there to watch over you, protect you, and help you, and encourage you, and strengthen you, and sustain you, and help you find your battles through life? When you get that bad medical report, when something happens in your family that pits you against an impossible situation, when you're facing a difficulty that you think is far too big and you're never going to overcome it, you're limiting the vision that you have because God says he is able to sustain you through anything and everything in life if you're willing to put your trust and hope in him. God ultimately has promised us victory in life. Listen to Philippians 1.21. For me... For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Bottom line, even in death, we can still be victorious if we've walked before God and lived the life that he wants us to, knowing that our hope is in eternity. It's time to change what we see and look at the bigger picture. I don't know what you're seeing, but you don't just have to see the problems you can look way beyond that and see the promises instead. Ah, uh, that's, somebody get that this morning. You stop looking at the problem and start looking at the promises that God has set for you in his word. Here's the problem, though. You're going to have to choose which one you want to look at. Hmm? You're either going to have to look at the problems, which, you know what, every single one of us are going to have, or we choose to look beyond those and look to the promises. Look to the promises. Are we going to focus on the problem or on the promise? Do we look for the bigger picture? I heard a funny story about a hen house where the rooster had all of his hens laying their eggs every day. 
One day, two little boys next door were playing football with a brand new white football. One of them accidentally kicked the football over the fence and it rolled right to the middle of the chicken yard. The old rooster strutted around, watching his hens laying eggs. Suddenly, bang, he bumped into the football. He looked at it amazed. Finally, after examining it for about 10 minutes, he called out all his hands. He says, ladies, come out here. When they'd all gathered round, he said, pointing to the ball, now, don't mean to be negative, girls, but there's the kind of eggs they're producing next door. You need to step up your efforts. <laughs> oh, dear. But you get it, don't you? What, do you? what are you looking at? What's your focus on? The little things, the problems. That, I'm, not, I'm not demeaning problems and, and sickness. People have to deal with all sorts of terrible issues in life. But look, even the worst thing you can think of is tiny compared to the fact that God is able and that God has promised a way through for you in every circumstance and situation of life. Here's the bottom line. Like those hands, we, God's promises are bigger than we can ever imagine. We just have to step up our efforts and focus on them. And you know what? We can so easily sometimes look at somebody else's life, somebody else's success, somebody else that doesn't have to go through what we're going through and begin to get envious and jealous and bitter about that. When all the time what we should be focusing on is the fact that God said, yes, I've got a blessing for Susie and a blessing for Lois and a blessing for Jane, but I've got a blessing for you and you and you and you. And come on, God is a blessing for every single one of us. How do I know? He's a heavenly father who loves to dispense good things to his children. Don't let the circumstances of life take your focus off the bigness of God and his promises to you. Got to keep going. 58 seconds left according to that clock, but I'm just going to ignore it. <laughs> Number four. There's only five to go, remember, so we're nearly there. <laughs> Are you ready to retune your hearing? Are you ready to retune your hearing? Be careful what you listen to and what you do with what you listen to. Mark, Mark 4, 24 simply says it like this. Take heed what you hear. Take heed what you hear. Be careful what you allow to go in there and then what you do with it because it can contaminate your faith, damage you, and damage others. 1 Kings 8 everybody's talking about recession, everybody's talking about poverty, everybody's talking about famine, everybody's talking about job layoffs, everybody's saying how things bad they are. And right in the middle of all those bad reports and negativity, here's what the prophet Elijah says. And everybody's moaning. Yeah. Do you ever get into the company of people who constantly moan? Do your head in, as it say here in Belfast. You know what, I have to be honest, when I get into the presence of people like that, seriously, I just want to get as far away from them as I possibly can. And in all this misery, chaos, disappointment, moaning, complaining, here's what Elijah says, 1 Kings 18, 41, but I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Ha, what a contrast. I hear the sound of, everybody's miserable. And Elijah says, but I can hear the blessing. I can hear the blessing. Of course, I'm talking about exercising our faith here. So, so, so many times we get caught up in joining with the negative spirit that exists in the world around us. That shouldn't be us. Listen, folks, I'm telling you, and again, I don't want to undermine any situation or any problem that you're going through this morning. I will sympathize with you. I will help you to the best of my ability if I can in the weakness of my humanity. I'll do my best for you. But here's the bottom line, folks. We should be skipping out of this church this morning the happiest, most content, satisfied people on the face of the planet. Why? Because we're born again, a new creation in Christ. We look, see, hear, walk, talk, think differently than everybody else, or we, at least we should. Let's put our foot on what we hear, even if we keep hearing it repeated time after time, because Elijah could tune in his hearing and hear something totally different. He tuned into a different frequency. There's no excuse anymore. 
Set yourself up for church on a Sunday morning, sunshine radio, switch it on in your car and get blessed before you walk through the doors of the church. What are you tuning into? It's not mind over matter, it's faith over unbelief. Believe God's word and what he says over what everybody else says. And think, can I say it straight like to you this morning as I possibly can from this pulpit? Stop caring what everybody else says. Who are you listening to, your Lord or everybody else? Or everybody else? 2 Samuel 5, 22 through 24, read it later. David's going into battle against the Philistines and he inquires of the Lord what he should do. And here's what God said to him. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly, because that means the Lord has gone out before you. <laughs> Brilliant. Don't do anything, David, until you hear me and what I'm doing, and then just follow me. <laughs> just follow me. David did exactly that, and he won a huge victory. I don't know what you're listening to, but I dare to believe God's report is true and better. I do hear the sound of victory coming for the church of Jesus Christ. I do hear the sound of victory that we can have in our own personal lives through the blessing of God. I can hear the sound of blessing from God on a daily basis because he provides the clothes on our back and the food on our table and health for our bodies that we can serve him. I can hear the sound of healing coming for those who need a touch for the power of God to heal them and take them up and lift them up and make them whole again. I believe that we can see our children rising up to praise God. They might be in misery now. They might not be serving God now but I dare believe that I can hear the word of God saying, I can bring your kids into a place where they're serving me. As believers, we shouldn't allow what we hear to overtake us. Let's sensitize our sense to what God wants to speak into our lives. Maybe somebody will say today, but, but pastor, you don't know what kind of bad news I have. I don't. And again, I don't want to minimize what, you think, what you're going through. What I can say to it is, it doesn't matter whether I understand or not, because your Lord does. Your Lord does. Don't put your hope and trust in me. I told you I'll help you the best I can, if I can. But put your trust in what God says to you, that he can heal your body, that he can heal your relationship, that he can take care of your kids, that he can bless your church. Come on, church, this morning. What are we tuning into? What are we listening to? Our God is able in spite of what others say. Let me quickly finish. Number five, here's the final question, and it's about taste. We've looked at what we hear, what we see, how we feel, etc. Here's the final question, can you taste the sweetness of victory? Go and read the story in 2 Kings 4 about a pot of stew during a famine. <laughs> As the men in the story began to eat it, they discovered that it had accidentally been poisoned. Elisha tells them then to put flour or meal into the pot and it saved them from the poisoning. I believe that this meal represents to us the bread of life, which is the word of God. Here's the bottom line. Whatever poison's coming into our lives, put the word of God into it and watch the difference. Watch the difference. Can you taste the sweetness of victory that comes by putting the word of God into the poisonous stuff that wants to inhabit our lives? Put some meal in the stew. Put some of the word of God in the stew this morning. Are your children making poor choices? Put some of the word of God in. Uh, put some of the word of God into their lives. Parents who are here this morning, whether your child's three months or 33, if they're in God's house or in your home, let them know that you trust God and let them hear the word of God, see the word of God. Don't be embarrassed when your kids walk in if you're playing Christian music in the house. Let them hear it. Put some of the word of God into the poisonous things that surround our homes, our families, our lives, our church. Start praying back to God the things that he's given you and leave them in God's care and keeping and cover them with the promises of the word of God. Faith places no limitations on God. The only limitation is us. So let's take the bread of God's word. Let's take it and put it into the poisonous circumstances of life. Indeed, every day put some of the meal of God into our lives and circumstances and get the victory over the sense of taste that the world wants to poison us with. Do you remember as our Lord was hanging on the cross, some of the people there attempted to give him a sponge dipped in vinegar and gall? 
Vinegar and gall has an extremely horrible, bitter taste. But I believe this symbolizes for us that they wanted Jesus to become bitter through the circumstances of what was happening to him. But Scripture says Jesus refused to drink it, the thing that they were offering to him. And at that moment, his actions essentially said, I refuse to let myself be ruled by what you want to give me and what you want to feed me. And I refuse to become bitter and angry. I want to stay in the plan and purpose of what my heavenly Father has for me. And look, I'll say it again this morning with the greatest of respect to everyone here. You may have been wronged. You may have been hurt. But if you really want to live victorious in this life, you need your put your foot on those situations with the Word of God and pour some of the Word of God into the poisonous things that people are coming against you with and say, I believe in what God says He has written in His Word. You know what? The devil wants to make you bitter, make you angry, get you upset, make you tense, messed up, but put your foot in his neck with the word and the authority of the word of God and simply use those same words. In the name of Jesus, Satan, get behind me. In the name of the Lord, circumstances, get away from me. I want to taste the sweetness of victory. Let me conclude a couple of paragraphs. And I thank you for your patience and listening. Singers, musicians, you can come as I talk. One preacher talking about David and Goliath focused on why David picked up five stones. Remember the story? He showed biblically that Goliath had also four brothers. And he suggested it was David's intention to wipe out Goliath's whole family, not just to take Goliath out, but enough stones to wipe the whole lot of them out. David's attitude was, I'm not just going to kill Goliath. If the big brothers want to pick a fight, bring them on. I've got the stones to do it. But I'll tell you my little thought about that. And I'm not disagreeing with the gentleman who suggested that. I think it's a brilliant suggestion. But let me share my own little thought about that. Do you know why I think David picked up four more stones than he needed? Because I think it was the Lord's way of saying to him, listen, son, and always remember it. Listen, David, I'll never send you into a battle against a great gigantic problem where I'll only give you enough to defeat him. I'll always give you more than enough to defeat the circumstances that surround you. Yes, David, one stone would be enough, but I'll give you more stones than you need, not just for this victory, but for more victories that you're going to have in the future. Hmm? Come on. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I doubt there's a person sitting here in this room this morning that God hasn't given at least one victory in life to. Come on. I'll tell you for a start, your greatest victory was accomplished the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you became his child. But since that moment, I can guarantee you every single one of us have seen other victories in our lives. But you know what? God just didn't give you one stone for that. <laughs> He's given you more stones you'll ever need to go and take victory every time you need it in the circumstances of life. Do you know this morning that God is able? He is able to help you kill those things that are keeping you out of the promises of God. The things we see, the things we hear, the things we taste, the things we feel, etc. And God has promised to give us more than enough to defeat any circumstance or any situation in life that we have to face. So here's the message for this church today. Let's start sensitizing our senses. Let's go out and sell some of the kings of this life that want to come against us our weaknesses, our doubts, our fears, our anxieties. Let's take control of the senses that God has given to us. For God is able. And if he is able, then we, in his strength, in his faith, in his courage, in his righteousness, in his holiness, in the things that he's given to us as his children, we too can be more than able and make our way through the trials, the tribulations, and the problems of life. Sensitize your senses, and watch what God will do.